Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for life. Through Jesus Christ, we are able to be in this place this morning. Lord, we ask that your presence be with us this morning. Remove any sins in this place so that we may not be separated from you, but we want to be close to you in this morning. As we about to receive a word from your throne of grace, open our hearts, open our minds, that we may be receptive unto your word. As we are learning about the tribes, we know all of us to enter into heaven, we are going to enter through one of the gates. Mm -hmm. So help us to understand the characters of these 12. May your spirit of understanding fill us as it filled with Bezel when he was about to build the sanctuary. Be with us in this place and may this message change our lives. May we not leave this place the same. We want to be different people, peculiar, and we are learning that we are Seventh-day Adventists. So help us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning once again. Um, have you been blessed so far this, this morning? Uh, are we awake? Or are we sleeping with our eyes open? God is good? And all the time. Okay, now before we do any study of God's word, let's just once again have a word of prayer. If we can just kneel down. Um, let us pray. Our gracious hand, Lord, Father, God in heaven. We just want to thank you for this privilege that we are at this prayer retreat this time. We could have been doing other things, but we just wait for this opportunity that we can come to actually know you better. And we're just asking that as we present this morning, that this may not just be intellectual knowledge, but that whatever we learn, may we practically apply it in our lives. Please be with us. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I believe we, we have our Bibles. Do we have our, our Bibles? Yes, if we can just show, show our Bibles, if we have our Bibles. Yes, not phones, but Bibles. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And yesterday morning, for the youth devotion, how many of you can remember what we covered? Just by the raise of hands, how many of us can remember what we covered in the youth devotion last yesterday morning? Okay, someone raised their hand. Can someone just give me a quick point? What were we looking at? Ruben. Ruben? Yeah. Okay, just anything about Ruben? Just one point, Elder? Okay, so unstable as waters. Unstable as, as waters. And what I'm going to do right now is we're just going to give a quick overview of the 144,000, then Sister Ruth will present on the tribe of, of Simeon. Now I want us to go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And when we get to the book of Revelation chapter 14, if we could say, Amen. Okay, and if you could read Revelation chapter 14, Verse 1 together. It says, And I said, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood.
sit on the Mount Zion, and with him are 144,000, having his father's name written in their, in their foreheads. So who stood on Mount Zion with the 144,000? And who is the Lamb? Okay, now I want us to go to quickly Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. And we're going to start reading from verse 1. I'll read verse 1, you read verse 2, and we'll read verse 8 together. Okay, and it reads. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, not upon the sea, nor on any tree. And saying, Heard not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000, of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000, Okay. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed twelve thousand. Okay. We can. Okay, we can end there. And we can see that in this list, we have the list that consists of the, the 12 tribes. Now, just one more text. If we can quickly just go to James chapter 1. Now, someone might be asking, why am I going to James chapter 1 when you're speaking of the 12 tribes? Because remember, in James chapter 1, we see that it's the, it, it, it's the chapter that says, count it all joy when you fall into what? into diverse temptation. Now, why exactly am I going to James chapter 1 when you're dealing with the 12 tribes? Now, are we in James chapter 1? Now, let's look at verse 1. I want us to actually consider what verse 1 says. It says, James, the servant of God, has in a bro, written. Now, what is James here called? A servant of God. Later on, what are the 144,000 known as? <laughs> okay, reading this verse again, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Then if you look, verse 2, it says, my brethren. So what, who is this letter actually addressed to? To the twelve tribes. Because if you look at verse 2, it says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into what? Into divers temptation. And if we can quickly just go to verse 8, it says, for a double-minded man is unstable in what? In all his way. And what was the character of Reuben? Interesting. Now, we'll look um, later as I actually touch on Joseph. I'll probably go deeper into this. Um, at this time, Ruth is going to present on, on Simeon. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. You know, um, just before I speak, I haven't got much time, but I want to just say this. The amount of challenges have, that have kind of come up recently to do with this talk kind of encouraged me a little bit. It seems that there's something great God is about to do, not through me as a person, but through each of us. And maybe the devil is trying to get in the way of that. So I'll ask for your prayers at this time. In fact, I'll ask if possible, where we are, we can just spend... 30 seconds in prayer. We'll kneel down and we'll pray together. Okay, um, so if possible, again, please bear with me and let's kneel for prayer. Everybody, pray in your hearts, especially for yourselves and for myself.
Take God in heaven. We come before your throne this morning. It's not because we're great and we have anything to attribute to our names, but we come feeling the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to you this morning asking that you may speak to us. Clearly, because the devil is upset, he's tried very serious and obstacles to prevent us from hearing your word. But I pray for the God who sits between terrorists, the one who's holding back the boys, to hold back the wiles of the devil from this retreat that we may hear a word from you. And maybe can one person, even me, be changed by the message you're speaking to us, especially in this moment. May we have our minds settled and grounded a bit further in truth to be prepared for the times ahead of us. Dear Father, help us not because we're worthy again, but because you promise that you send us your spirit, that you'd show us great and wondrous things which we know not from your law. Give us your spirit this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. This morning we're going to be talking about Simeon. Yesterday we talked about who? Oh, there was a bit of a sad. Who did you talk about? Reuben. Why are we talking about Reuben and Simeon and Joseph and Levi? Why are we talking about that? We're going to be talking about that because it pertains to our salvation, it pertains to 144,000. I want us to um, go through a couple of things through this study today. Again, as the screen says, we're going to be looking at um, the, hundred, uh, the 12 tribes, specifically today about Simeon. Go to the next slide. In my presentation this morning, I've got a couple of objectives I want to reach. First of all, we're going to look a little bit about the early beginnings of Simeon, that tribe. Next, we're going to look at the key content of this little talk this morning, which is passion, because that was the key of Simeon's problem. Next thing we're going to look at, we're going to look at their later history, possibly if we have time, but I believe the key thing they want to do is look at their past. We want to really have an inclination for the last thing, the most important thing, which is looking at what practical solutions could we as Christians, as people preparing to be 144,000, gain from the life of Simeon. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Part one, hopefully this is going to go quickly. We're at Jacob's deathbed. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49. And if somebody has a loud voice, reads for me verses 5 to 7. Genesis 49, verses 5 to 7. Simeon and Neva and Levi are brethren, instruments of authority, are in their habitation. Okay. O oh my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. My honor, be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self will they give down a war. Okay. I I think we're kind of a bit familiar with this story, but just to remind you, Simeon and Levi were brothers who decided, and if you go back to the story, I'll reference it for you, the verses up here, and you can also get the slides from me. In Genesis 34, you find that they kill almost a whole city for the purpose of revenge. They were instruments of what? Cruelty. Just a forewarning, I've got a short time. So it's going to be brief with each slide, so you need to have a quick pen. What were Simeon's issues in that story? Coming back to it, what kind of thing do you kind of um, relate to? When you think of Genesis 34, of Simeon and Levi, what would you say was their problem in that story? I, I put down, I'll put down the things that I thought. There was anger, which is a definite problem. There was deceit, lying. Stealing, murder, and self-justification. Go back to the story, and the very last verse you see, they say a particular reason for doing this crime. What did they say they did it for? For what purpose? Pardon? For my sister. Do you think we were going to treat her as a harlot? They said. Something along those lines. So they had these different problems. Keep that in mind. Here in commentary, Ellen Wright writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, 
Next in age to Reuben were Simeon and Levi. They had been united in their cruelty toward the Shechemites, and they had also been the most guilty in what? In selling who? Concerning them, it was declared, I will divide them in Jacob and will scatter them in Israel. Just as a thought, as a side thought, I hadn't thought about this, but when we're having our studies as young people, you know how the 12 tribes are split apart? Imagine if Simeon and Levi had actually remained together as like a, a tribe. What kind of combination would that have been? If you look at their past history, what do you think the future would have been for them? A disaster. Disaster. God is good, don't you think? Um, another quote from Eternity Past. Jacob felt that there was cause for deep humiliation. Cruelty and what? Falsehood were the character of his sons. False gods and idolatry had to some extent gained a foothold even in his household. I don't have any time at all to expand on this, but I want you to keep this in your mind and maybe to study later on. There is a link between what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about controlling the passions and self-justification. All of these, I believe, link back to idolatry. You put yourself above who? Think about it, you, they had a problem between anger. When you're angry, who are you putting for a scar on you? Idolatry is, is linked with these two things. And because of, I believe, their idolatry, they were able then to commit more heinous crimes. Do you see what I mean? Just look into that a little bit. Right? Right. I'm going a little bit at a lightning speed, so keep up. Numbers 25. Note down that chapter. I don't have time to go through it. It feels a bit bad to do this. But what happened in Numbers 25? Can anybody disclose what they remember of that story? Dad? Yes? Balaam and Balak. Balaam and Balak. What happened in that story? Anybody remember? Just before Canaan, what happened? The Moabites. Actually, I, I want to quickly read that verse. Numbers 25, I want us to read one key text, something that I noticed while studying this chapter. Numbers 25, I want us to read which tribe seemed to be at the forefront of this apostasy. Um, Numbers 25, if you turn your Bibles there, and somebody could read for me, I'd like you to read verse 14. Now, the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, the son of Saul, as prince of chief house among the Simeonites. Okay, remember that story where the priest was so zealous for the Lord that in order to stay the plague, he had to slay a man who had brought in a Midianitish woman even in the camp of God, who were fornicating in the public view of everybody. I didn't know this, but what was this guy from again? Simeon. Do you kind of see the problem that's building up here? We find him at Jacob's deathbed. He's there being cursed for his anger or a lack of what? Self-control. We find in the next future generations, we are in now the borders of Canaan. What's the same problem again? Self-control. Again, we'll look at these points. Last time we said there was what? Deceit. Deceit. What? Last. This story. That's something new, isn't it? But like I'm trying to highlight, it all links back to the fact that they couldn't control themselves. There's anger, murder, self-justification, stealing. This is the inheritance of the simulants. Keep that in mind. Again, it's a lack of self-control. We're moving on to the second part. I want to look at a little bit of this problem of anger and a lack of control, especially sexually. We all know this, so hopefully it's a review. There are two powers. Let's go back. How many powers? There are two powers which control the mind. What powers do we know of that govern our, our bodies? Yes, we have higher, higher and lower powers. We'll just quickly go through this. Things that are under the category of, of higher powers are reason, the moral faculty,
faculties, more restraint. I'm getting the straight from the spirit of prophecy. These are to, to do with the what? Chronicle law. We have in parallel to that the lower powers, things like what? Uncontrolled passions, the animal propensity, she calls them. These actually, I don't want to say them negatively, the, the second part, these things in and of themselves, we kind of need the law of powers. They're what helps us to impulsively do things. If you're running or there's a danger, what takes over? Do I have to reason? There's a lion coming forward and now I need to engage the frontal lobe and I, no. It's natural for you to react. God gave us law of powers, why? Some decisions you, need to, you don't need to think about. You just need to act. But it's interesting she says this. Um, I'll, I'll just highlight. She says that you must bring the lower powers in subjection to what? The higher powers. The higher powers. Um, okay. I'll just show you a little bit. Uh, actually, write down this verse. Romans 7, verse 23 and 25. Read verse 23. Romans 7 and 23. The Bible talks about something similar, it's just in a different way. Romans 7, 23. Romans 7, verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay. Um, if you read that little passage, you kind of hear Paul talking about the carnal man and the spiritual man. There is a constant war, and I think that's sort of connected to the fact that you have your high powers, the, the spiritual man, what should be right, and then you have your lower powers as well, the carnal man. This is a little bit of science, because I like science. You have the frontal lobe, which is located here, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. Each of them serves a different purpose, and you know, they're up here, but we don't have time. Looking at this passage again, he was a man of what? Strong passions. I wanted to highlight a couple of things that we saw in that passage. Did you notice that self-control was the issue? Not only that, the anger problem is mentioned how many times in the passage? Three times. In their anger, Cassidy their anger. Fierce their wrath. Think there's a problem there? Hunger, hunger, wrath, self will uh, Another point I want to make for us now. Our frontal lobes, do you know that's where God usually speaks to us? Think about that one. Keep going. Now, this is the meat of the issue. We've talked about the past. Now I want us to look at kind of how we relate to this. And actually for me, yes, for me, I found that I have in the past struggled with this very thing. So I'm not looking at it from a perspective of somebody who's not experienced it, but maybe my family can bear testimony. I don't know how to express this clearly. Let me think. Let's read the verses. Roman, uh, Proverbs 16, verse 32. What does it say? Somebody read in a loud voice for us, please. Romans 16, verse 32. Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Amen. Amen. We know what the Bible says about anger. Proverbs 25 reflects the same thoughts. I want you to think about this, and this is where the study for us and young people got really deep. Imagine it in the time of trouble, right? Put yourself in the time of trouble. Let's say, hypothetically, by God's grace, this isn't the case, you have a problem with anger. What do you do if people start persecuting you in those prison houses and you have a problem with anger? You, you do what? Fight back. Would that reflect the character of Christ? Would that not reflect the character of Christ? We have to really overcome these things when? 
today. Listen, Ellen White says this, if impatient words are spoken to you, never what? Never. We don't think it's a big deal right now when our children, perhaps, or even our family members say a word against us and we just say, in reply. But these incidences build up a character. They build up a, a way of life, really, that if you think you, you, you're okay now, by the time it gets to the situation when we're tried, what do you think will be the result of what you're building? It says a soft answer turns away wrath, and there's wonderful power in what? Silence. Words spoken in reply to one who's angry, sometimes so early to exasperate, but anger met with silence in a tender, forbearing spirit quickly dies away. Again, think about that. That verse says this is that worthy, that you endure grief, suffering, what? Sometimes, and I forgot to highlight this, in, in Simeon and Levi's case, were they wrong? They were very wrong. They could have justified themselves. But the Bible says what? Suffering wrongfully. Was Christ wrong on the cross? Think about that. Let's think about that when we, we are going about our business. Psalm 37 verse 4 says you should what? Cease from anger. This is the thing I want us to highlight. Study this. I don't have time to go through it. It is a shame. If you study the peace offering that's spoken about in Deuteronomy 18, when you know, when you know what to do with your anger, it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing. I I read this, uh, this study actually, and for me it was a blessing because I realized what the significance of laying your anger on Christ's breast means. What it means to lay your anger on the shoulders of Christ. In that time, they take this peace offering and they make peace with God. So too, we can make peace with God in the same way. We can have a victory over what? Our anger through the same kind of means. Again, I'll provide you the slides. Christ is our example. Lay our anger issues on his shoulders. Lean on his breast. He is there for this purpose. He came to human being. He was tempted to these things so that we can relate to him. That part we're looking at is their late history. I just want to look a little bit, a little bit on that issue of lacking self-control in lustful for terms. It says here, at the, somebody read me actually, please somebody read that passage. At the numbering of Israel, just before their entrance to Canaan, Simeon was the smallest tribe. Moses, in his last blessing, made no reference to Simeon. In the settlement of Canaan, this tribe had only a small portion of Judah's lot, and such families as afterwards became powerful, formed different colonies, and settled in territory outside the borders. So what happens to them in the future history? They just disappear. They just disappear. In line with this point, what happened is just before they were numbered before entering the promised land, we, we, we looked at numbers what? 25. Do you know, if you look at the, the numbers before Canaan and after Canaan when they were getting in, there was a great reduction in number. And like I said before, that is to do with the fact that at um, Shittim, there was a great overindulgence <coughs> sexually. And that tribe, actually, that was one of their biggest downfalls. And I want to say right now to us as God's people who are just about to enter into Canaan, we have a big, big problem ahead of us. Even in this age where we're living in, I want to highlight one key thing that I saw when I was researching this. We think we're okay. I think we think we're okay. But I want to read this fact. It says here, this is an age where corruption is teeming everywhere, where the minds and bodies of men and women, in a, where the minds of men, uh, where the minds and bodies of men and women in a healthful condition, where the animal passions subject to the higher powers of the mind, it might be comparatively safe to teach 
teach that boys and girls and youth of still more mature age could be benefited by being much in each other's society. The boys, the girls, girls and boys, listen to this. It is a fact, a painful fact, that there is not one girl of a hundred who is pure-minded, and there is not one boy of one hundred whose morals are untainted. Sometimes we have this practice, especially growing up, where we just let children play. Look at these children, you know, children. You don't know when your children are learning all this stuff they know about. You have never asked your children, when did you learn that? Or has that not happened to you yet? Sometimes, I was speaking earlier this morning, I want to just hurry up and, and I'm getting to the close of what I want to say, but I found I found that actually um, speaking to, to young people, maybe it's because they're I'm close to their age, kids know a lot. Too much. And I, I was speaking to Dad this morning and he said, you know, back in his day, there used to be uncles who teach them things about, you know, what happens before people are married and, you know, things like that. But actually, do you know who's teaching your children? They're friends. And you know, sometimes that would have wonder, why did this happen? Why is my child doing such things and such, such, such? I think this is a stage where because we don't have family around us, especially I know a lot of us are from African culture or black culture, but we need to teach children what happens, kind of. Do you, do you know what I'm trying to say? We need to be aware that if you're not teaching them, somebody else will, the TV will. This is a problem still. Again, dress links into that. Extravagant dress, even in marriage, we need to be careful in my sense, because you could indulge over too much, and I'll leave it there. One thing I want to highlight, this is the last point I'm making now. First, 2 Peter chapter 3, this is the very last verse I'm going to read, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. That's the last verse, and I'll read this quotation and we're done. Somebody in the loud voice. This is my favorite verse, so the louder the voice, the better. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love. There is lust teeming everywhere. There is uncontrolled passions, anger, and it seems impossible to overcome. But the Bible says, according as his divine power hath given us, us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, that we might escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Simeon, as it says here, had nothing to his name. His tribe just blurred into obscurity. But somehow, his name was found written on the gates of life. For me, that tells me something important. It tells me that sometimes in life, you may feel that there is nothing you can record of any good nature to yourself. There is nothing that you can say, you know, at least I go to church or whatever. No, there is nothing that you can say, I've done this great thing. But God is so good and his blood is so cleansing that you can even enter into the kingdom of heaven if you repent before him. This is interesting because it says this very last quote, in his prayers the Father Christ gave the world a lesson that should be great on the mind and soul. This is life eternity, he said, that they may know the be the true God and Jesus Christ who thou has sent. This is what? True education. It imparts power. Listen to this, it says, the experiments. What does that mean? experience day by day experimental knowledge of who god and jesus christ who he said transforms the man into the image of god it gives to man the mastery of himself bringing every impulse and passion of the lower nature under what the control of the higher powers of the mind it takes it, it, its possessor as a son of god and on uh, and an heir of heaven, it brings him into communion with the mind of the infinite and opens to him the rich treasures of the universe. The bottom line of what I'm trying to say this morning is Simeon had a problem, but that problem 
we, by the grace of Christ, will overcome even in this generation. It doesn't really matter what our past may be, but first John chapter one verse seven says the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Now um, I'm gonna hand over to Michael who's gonna talk about Jason. Sorry. Good morning once again. Amen. That was that was a blessing from Sister Lee. Amen. Amen. Now, once again, before we do any study of God's word, I believe that we are here at a prayer retreat and we should be a people of, of prayer. So once again, we're just gonna have a quick word of prayer. If we can just bow where we are, let us pray. Um, let us pray. Our gracious and loving Father who are in heaven. We just wanna thank you for this opportunity. And as we continue during this study, we just ask him that we may receive a special blessing from heaven. And I'm just asking that whatever we learn, may it not just be intellectual knowledge, but that at the end of the day, that this experience that we have at the prayer retreat, that may it be a change, a life-changing experience for each one of us. And may we be able to share it with people, whether it's in our whether it's in uni, in our workplace, or in our day-to-day -day lives. Thank you. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, as we can see, the title on the screen is Lessons from the, from the Life of, of Joseph. Lessons from the Life of, of Joseph. Now, I want us to go to the let me see. That one? Okay. So, as we can see, we're going to be looking at four key points. And, and the first key point we're going to be looking at is character development, the life of Joseph, the comparison between the character of Joseph and Simeon, and then practical application. So what are the four points we're going to be looking at? What's point number one? Character development. The second point? The life of Joseph. The third point? Simeon and Joseph. And the fourth point is practical application. Now, if we can go to, to the next slide. Character development. Now, let's go to, to the next slide as well. Okay. What, what picture is that? We all have our Bibles, right? Amen. If we can go to, to the next slide. Let's quickly turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, verse 1 to 7. I want us to understand something very, very serious. As I believe that you and me, we are living in critical times and we need to understand the times we live in. Are we in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7? Okay, and it reads, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accuser, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, head minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, for, for of this sort are they which create, which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, lead away with divers, divers lust. And I want us to read verse 7 together. It says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, could this actually be said of us that as individuals we could be learning so many things in the scriptures, but we can actually never actually come into experience of, of Jesus Christ through his truth. I mean, we can have a knowledge of Christ, but you and me, we need to get to the point where we actually take the theoretical into practical application. Amen. Now, there's a quotation, if we can go to the next slide. The next slide. This is Consul's 
from the church, CCH41.1, and it reads, I saw that we should not put off the coming of the, of the Lord, say the angel. Now let's read what the angel says. It says, prepare, prepare for what is coming upon the, the earth. Let your works correspond with your, with your faith. I saw that the mind must be stayed upon God, and that our influence should tell for God and his what? And his two. Now we can see here that from this quotation, the very first bit is that you and me should not put what? Should not put off the, the coming of, of the Lord. Now is it possible that even though we are here today, most of us are actually careless in our day-to-day -day lives that we are actually not preparing for the, for the second coming of, of Jesus Christ. And the quotation carry, carries on reading. We cannot honor the Lord when we are careless and, and indifferent. We cannot glorify him when we are desponding. We must be in earnest to secure our own salvation and to save others. In all importance should be attached to this, and everything besides should come in secondary. Now, there's another quotation I want us to consider from, from the same book. If we can just go to the next quotation. We can skip that one and go to the, to the last quotation. Yes, it says, I saw that all heaven is interested in the salvation, in our salvation, and we shall be indifferent. Shall we be careless and as though it is a small matter whether we are saved or, or lost? Shall we slight the sacrifice that has been made for us? Some have done this, they have trifled with others, they have trifled, they have trifled with offered mercies, and the throne of God is upon them. God's spirit will not always be the greed. It will depart. It will depart if grieved a little what? A little longer. Now we see that what that God's spirit will what will not always be grieved. And we should ask ourselves this question is. By yours and my lifestyle, are we actually grieving the Holy Spirit? Now, the quotation carries on reading. After all has been done that God can do to save men, if they show by their lives that they slight, the slightly offered mercy, death will be their portion, and it will be dearly purchased, it will be a dreadful death. For they will have to feel the agony that Christ felt upon the cross to purchase for them the redemption which they have re refused, and they will then realize what they have lost, eternal life and immortal inheritance. The real sacrifice that has been made to save souls shows us their worth. When the precious soul is lost, it is, it is lost for, forever. Now, as I mentioned, that we're going to be looking at the what? At the life of, of Joseph. Now, I want us just to go to the, to the next slide. This will be our last slide, then we'll just be focusing on the scriptures. And the question is, what character are you building? Now, I want us to think about this. What character are you and me building on a daily basis? Are we building a character that will fit us for heaven? This is something for us, for us to think about. And once again, for those of us who remember what the topic is, what are we going to be looking at? Lessons from the what? From the life of, of Joseph. Now, if we can quickly go to the book of Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And when we get there, if you could say Amen. Now I'll quickly read, I'll start from verse 1, it says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of, of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the land was with the sons of Bela, and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph 
never bore his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him, loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto, unto him. Now it's very, very interesting when you consider the, the life of Joseph. And because you don't have much time, I'm not actually going to look deep into it. But going back to verse, to verse 4, it says, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they, they hated what? They hated him. Now it's very, very interesting when we consider the, the character of, of Joseph that actually, that his, his brethren actually what? Hated him. Now, if we carry on reading, I want us to go to actually, if we carry on reading in the same chapter, reading from verse 5, it says, And Joseph dreamed the dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him even more. And he said unto them, Here I pray unto you this dream which I have which I have dreamed. And we see that because Joseph has told his brother a dream, but they hated what? Joseph what even even more and we understand that what that Joseph was what was the favorite of the what of the father but I want to actually consider something about uh, about the character of Joseph that actually stood out now if we quickly just go to two chapters over to Genesis chapter 39 Genesis chapter 39 Genesis chapter 39 Genesis chapter 39 are we in Genesis chapter 39 now we obviously understand the the story of what when Joseph was brought down to what to Egypt in the what actually let's read verse one it says and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh captain of the guard an Egyptian bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites which had brought him down hither and the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in the what? In his hand. Now it's very, very interesting when you actually consider this, because if we look at verse 2, it says, and the Lord was with what? The Lord was with, was with Joseph. Now can, now can we say this of, of us, that in our day-to-day -day lives, whatever we do, is the Lord with you and me? Now it's, it came his own reading, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the what? That the Lord was with what? Was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his what? In his hand. So here we see that, that Potiphar, that he saw that, what, that, the, that the Lord was with what? Was with was with Joseph. I want to, to skip on as we actually try to make sense, sense of this. And let's go to, to verse 4 on what it says. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to the passing of the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptian house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord all that he had in his house and all in the in the field. Now let's carry on reading and go to, to verse 7. It says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to to my hand. And then verse 9 says, There is none greater in his, in this house than I, neither he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against, against God? So we see here, right from the character of Joseph, one of the things of Joseph is we see that earlier on as we read, we saw that the what? That the Lord was what? Was with Joseph and Joseph what? Feared God. And it got to the point of him where he was actually tried in a situation and he realized how much, how much he, what, he loves God that he, he wasn't even willing to what? To sin against, against God. Now I want us to actually consider this. Let's keep our finger right here and go to Psalms chapter five verse one. 
Keeping our finger right here and go to the book of Psalms, chapter 5, verse 1. Psalms chapter 5, verse 4, actually. Psalms chapter 5, verse 4. But keeping our finger in Genesis chapter 39, Psalms chapter 5, verse 4. Are we there? It says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in what? In wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with what? With thee. We see that what that God does not want. God does not delight in what? In, in what? In wickedness. And we saw that in the character of what? Of Joseph, one of the things that stood out is what? Is that the Lord was with what? Was with him and he what? And he feared God. Now the question for us to think about is, first of all, is, is the Lord with you? And do you and me actually fear God? Now if, now if we look at the other side of this question, if the Lord is not with us, and if we do not fear God, then who is with us? Because remember, there is only what? Two sides. And here we see that what? That Joseph actually what? Feared God. The Lord was with what? Was it Joseph? Because I remember, I mentioned we should keep our finger in Genesis 39. Did we keep our finger there? Now going back to verse, to verse 9. Let's go back to verse 9. To verse 9, are we there? Yeah. It reads again, There is none greater in this house than I, neither he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against, against God? And it came to pass, as he spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her, to lie by her or be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do the business, but there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, and what? And fled and got him out. So we see that what that Joseph actually what? Fled from the what? From sinning against what? against God. So we see that Joseph in his character, Joseph was a what? Was a man of what? Of principle. Joseph actually what? Exercised what? Self-control. And we saw on the other hand that what? That Simeon what? This man had a what? A serious anger and he, he did not exercise what? Self-control. Now let's actually think about this. Do you and me when we are faced in different situations, whatever the situations we are faced with in life, are we moved by our emotion? Or do we make decisions because we love God and fear God? Now I want us to turn our Bibles to the book of James. I mentioned this text earlier on, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and we're going to be looking at verse 1. As we try to bring this to, to a close. James chapter 1, verse 1. Are we there? James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, here we see that what? That James is called a what? A servant of God and of the what? And of the Lord what? Jesus Christ. Now I want you to bear this in mind that James is called what? The servant of God and the Lord and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now if we go to Revelation chapter 14, this is actually going to make sense what I've been saying all along. If we go to Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, actually sorry, Revelation chapter 7, yes, Revelation chapter 7. Are we in Revelation chapter 7? Yes. Okay, let's read verse, verse 1. It reads in verse 1. And after these things I saw the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel descend, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea 
saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our what? The servants of our God in our what? In their four hands. So we see that these 144,000 that will be sealed are called what? The servants of what? Of God. Now going back to James chapter 1. Going back to James chapter 1, verse 1. Going back to James chapter 1, verse, verse 1. Going back to James chapter 1, verse 1. Are we there? It says, James the what? A servant of God and of the what? And of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, what are the 144,000? They are what? Those that are seen are what? The servants of what? Of God. Now it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into what? Into diverse temptation. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, when you actually look at this letter that actually James was speaking, this was actually written to the what? To the 12 tribes that are what? That are scattered abroad. This is why in verse 2 he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into what? Into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trial of your what? Of your faith, what? Worketh patience. And if you remember Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, here is the what? The patience of the what? Of the saints. Now, I don't know if you guys are seeing what I'm seeing. Now, if we go to verse 7, verse 6 of the same chapter, it says, Let him ask in faith, nothing what? Wavering. For he that wavereth is what? Is like a wave, sea driven with the wind and what? And tossed. And we see that something that is wavering is not what? Is not stable. And what was the characteristic of what? Of Reuben? Unstable, because if you look at verse 9, I mean verse 8 of the same chapter, it says, A double minded man is unstable in what? In all his, his ways. So we see that this letter that was actually written in James chapter 1, this was actually what? Written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And it's interesting when you saw verse 2, it started off by saying, My brethren, count it all joy. When he fall into what? Diverse temptation. Because when you look at verse 12 of the same chapter, it says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is what? Tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that what? That love him. And we saw that what? That Joseph actually what? Joseph loved the Lord. That he wasn't actually willing to what? to do any wickedness against, against God. Now I'm gonna ask this question once again. Do you and me truly, truly love God? And if the answer is yes, if we truly, truly, truly love God, why do we carry on sinning? That's the question for each one of us to consider. I wanna repeat the question. We have each one of us here say that we love God, right? And if we love God, or profess to love God, why do we carry on breaking the heart of God and carry on sinning? Now I want us to go to Revelation chapter 14. We only have about five minutes. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Are we there? Okay, and it reads, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their house. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but but the hundred and forty-four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not devoured with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithsoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God, and to the what? 
and to the lamp. Now I want us to consider verse 4. It says, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they were what? Virgin. So we see that these 144,000, they were what? Pure, right? And it says, these are they which what? We 